Now, phishing is a form of social engineering. So, social engineering is whenever you trick somebody, you take advantage of uh, usually someone's kindness or you, you use, you basically fool them, deceive them in a way to disclose information. This can be information disclosure. This can be you know, performing an action like leaving a door open or perhaps sending out uh, an email, maybe doing a configuration setting that is in benefit of the attacker. So there's many different types of techniques to fool somebody. You basically, you're using your charm and personality to uh, trick somebody into doing an action or performing uh, something for the attacker. So a lot of times this takes advantage of social norms. Now social norms are normal ways in which human beings act within a society. For example, uh, when you open a door and you hold a door open for someone else, that's a social nor norm. It's seen as a nice thing to do in many circumstances. Or if you see somebody walking towards an elevator and you press the door open button on the elevator to let them in, to give them a chance to ride the elevator as well, that's a social norm. Uh, all of these things are just basic ways, basic manners that human beings come to expect from one another and attackers will take advantage of that. Now, not all hackers, you know, you might think of a hacker in the traditional sense or from a movie where they're just sitting in the dark room, click clacking away at a keyboard. You know, not all hackers are like that. Some hackers are actually quite personable. They have social skills and they can talk and they can uh, wheedle their way into situations. So don't think of all types of hackers as uh, nerdy people sitting in a dark corner alone just typing away trying to code a million lines per minute charm and personality play a huge role in social engineering and in many hacking attempts oftentimes it's easy for a hacker to call a company and to talk with uh, a receptionist or maybe even somebody within a certain department and just gather some basic information to talk to them as if they were an employee themselves or maybe they're a vendor and just to talk, oh, hey, have you been experiencing problems with this type of server? Oh, what are you talking about? We use this type of server. Oh, yeah, of course, right. I, I was thinking about a couple of years ago when you had a different type of server. I'm not sure if we ever had that server. We're usually running this. Oh, right, okay, thanks a lot. And just from that five-second conversation, attacker might gather what type of server, what operating system is being used. That's a huge advantage from the attacker's standpoint. Now they know what type of operating systems to exploit, what things to look for whenever they're doing their, their attacks. Oftentimes with phishing attacks, phishing attacks are a form of email attack. This is where an attacker <clears throat> will try and imitate a real legitimate source to trick a user. Uh, I'm sure most of us are familiar with phishing attacks in some form of fake emails, emails that look fake. Obviously, they're fake because they might be misspelled where they're from a, a source that doesn't quite match up, usually your instincts will kick in, you, it will help you identify what a phishing email looks like. Phishing emails uh, can look pretty legitimate though. You know, so not all of them are easily spotted. Like this is an Amazon phishing email. Okay, so it's sent with the Amazon logo, has a refund notification. It looks legitimate with the font choices and the formatting um, and it's stating to the user oh we have a refund available for you but you need to update your billing address with us and a user might look at this and think oh I do a lot of a lot of business with Amazon I order a lot of products and I just ordered some things uh, maybe there's a problem let me click the link and if they click on the link with the email it's gonna send them to a malicious website it might send them to a website that will do what's known as a drive-by download or a download of malicious files very quickly without the user's uh, knowledge. So this type of phishing email, uh, the more legitimate phishing emails are those of greater concern. And the way phishing emails become successful is that they try and take advantage of users when they're, you know, when their guards down, when they're not quite as aware, when they're Maybe it's after a long day, they check their email and they see something like this and they're like, 
they just automatically click it without thinking about it too hard. That's how these uh, emails are successful. And they, they try and catch people when they're unawares. And if you have, if you're sending out thousands and thousands of these phishing emails, if people are in the right state of mind, they're probably going to understand that these are illegitimate or they're malicious. But if you catch somebody who's tired or maybe it's a long day of work, they might just automatically click on the email or you might find somebody, maybe a, an elderly person who's not very tech savvy, who might think that, oh, this is how the process is done. So basically hackers are playing statistics or sending out multiple emails to make sure that they get a hit on one or two of them. Now, how you, can you detect an email to see if it's a phishing attempt? Well, first you can examine the URL. If you hover over a link, so if we hover over one of the links in this email, like here, we'll see a URL pop up at the bottom of our browser if we're using a, a web-based uh, email platform. And then you can examine that URL to see if it's been modified in any way. So does it say Amazon.com? Or does it say something that's spelled similarly to Amazon, but not quite Amazon, like ama.zon.com? Or it could be a completely different URL. That's a sure tell sign. If you click on the link itself, and you look in your browser bar, you'll see maybe a lack of a transport layer security certificate. So if we look in our browser, if you look at the top of your browser in the search bar, this is above the search bar, you're going to see a lock, okay? And that lock is going to tell you that you have an HTTPS connection, which is secured with uh, transport layer security. I have this cut off in my browser just so, because I have a bunch of links up there, I don't want everyone to see, but this uh, this browser bar basically is where the, the address, the web address for your website is shown. And then just to the left of that, you're going to see a lock. If you don't see a lock, you don't have a valid uh, certificate with the website. And a company like Amazon or a bank is going to have an HTTPS website, a website that's secure with transport layer security, so you should always see that lock for a legitimate website. If you don't, then you know that you may have clicked on a malicious link. Also, a great piece of advice is to never click on links with email. Instead, contact the vendor directly. So if you receive a link in a description from uh, Amazon, Instead of clicking on the link from the email, just call Amazon or go log into Amazon.com and click on your account. Click on your portion, get help through the chat function. That's much more uh, effective because then you can verify if they actually sent you a refund request or something that's being sent to your email directly. And if not, then you know that that was a phishing attempt. You can also, like I said, hover over links to display the URL at the bottom of the screen. That's a way of also examining the URL before you even click on the link to see if it's been modified in any way. And certain uh, email clients and firewalls can help protect against uh, emails, phishing emails in an enterprise environment. They can detect when these emails, based on their content, contain possible phishing information. Now there's phishing and then there's spear phishing. Phishing is usually sent out to many different users and the same message is sent out to each user, like that Amazon message we saw earlier. A spear phishing e attack, this is a type of email that's tailored to an individual. So this is where the uh, email itself or the message is directed right at that individual and it'll contain personalized information and details that will uh, be specified for that individual and might be something that the individual is interested in. A good example I like to use is uh, many years ago I worked with a penetration testing company. We had a penetration testing contract for a company and we set up a spear phishing email to target the company's CEO. That CEO 
liked two things. He really liked uh, hockey, and he really liked a certain charity. So we set up a sphere phishing email saying, hey, if you buy these hockey tickets through us or his favorite team, we it's a portion of the proceeds are going to go benefit this charity, which so happened to be his favorite charity. Okay, so the email was this perfect bait for the CEO. And he ended up clicking on the link to try and buy the tickets. Well, when he clicked on the link, it installed a piece of malware on his uh, device. I think we had a PDF that we sent along with it, like a flyer, and we had a link within that PDF. So when he clicked on the link within the PDF, it executed a malicious script, gave us a backdoor into his device, and we were able to gather a lot of information because we had access to the CEO's computer at that point. So this type of attack involves research by the attacker and can be incredibly effective even against people trained to detect phishing emails. Now when you target a CEO like that or somebody high up in the organization, it's known as a whaling attack. And a whaling attack is this type of spear phishing attack but it's against a high value target or a high profile individual. So these are going to be corporate leaders, you can be uh, government officials, high-ranking government officials, maybe celebrities, or people with a lot of money. So when you successfully target one of these people, usually the payout's much better because you have, you know, they have more resources, more power associated with them that you can exploit. When we talk about social engineering attacks over the phone, that's called vishing. Okay, it's voice phishing, essentially, V-I-S-H-I-N-G, phishing. So the one you probably heard many times, unfortunately, is, uh, you know, we've been trying to reach you regarding your car's extended warranty or your warranty's expired. Th these types of attacks are really common. They're the same type of thing as email attacks, but they're phone scams or robocalls. They can be usually automated and you might have an automated portion of the call that'll then uh, send you to an individual if you, you know, press a button or you say, oh yes, I wanna talk to you about lowering my interest rate or whatever. Sometimes the entire conversation can be scripted and automated so that you'll have automated responses based on your uh, text response or your voice response. So, and the phone number for these is often spoofed often spoofed to mirror your area code for your phone. Now for me, I have a phone area code outside of the place I live. So when I see uh, a phone call from that area code, I automatically know it's, it's a scam call. Now a lot of people have the area code, now most people have an area code for their phone where they currently live. So that doesn't really work and it's effective way for these scammers to get you to at least answer the call. So these are all forms of social engineering. Uh, some of them are going to be less sophisticated than others. A, a regular phishing attack or a regular vishing attack is going to be much less complicated than a spear phishing attack or a whaling attack where you have tailored the uh, message to the individual. Mm -hmm.